Here. All right, so uh, welcome to the final lecture of the course this semester. We have Dr. Kuna Cho, who is a research scientist or senior research scientist at ByteDance, you know, the TikTok company. He actually used to work at Spotify as a research scientist before joining ByteDance. And before that, he was a PhD student at Queen Mary University in London, during which he made a research visit to NYU visiting my lab. And he's one of those people who has expertise in both AI and music. So he is an actual bassist, if I recall correctly. I mean, the bassist, guitarist, and all the same thing, right? <laughs> so he can actually, he will be able to answer any of the questions you have, not only about the machine learning, but also about audio processing and also music itself. So listen to what he can tell you, because he's going to tell you that all you need is AI and music, and do make sure that you ask as many questions as possible. Kunu, the floor is all yours. Okay, yeah, thank you for the nice uh, introduction, although it was a little offending as a basis. Um, yeah, so this is the title, All You Need in AI Music, which is not true, but, uh, you know, titles are like that. And uh, and also thanks to uh, Kenya's nice introduction, I guess the stage is not very necessary, which makes us to go to the next page, which is the most important slide of this whole talk. Uh, also same for you in the people in Zoom. So be ready to take a picture or something. Uh, take your phone and ta -da. So this is my YouTube channel where I put my music, where you can find the best music ever. Okay, now, actually, this is the actual beginning, abstract uh, of the talk today. What is AI and music AI? In this talk, we are gonna review the What's going? What's happening in music AI as a field? And um, one special um, perspective of this uh, talk is that we're gonna categorize the music AI into four different um, types: analysis, creation, signal synthesis, and signal processing. So that uh, yeah, and then out of four, we're gonna put a little more time on the analysis part, which will be then break down into timbre, notes, and lyrics. Um, yeah, and along the way, I will not only just uh, simply like introduce the models and stuff, more more like I will try to deliver some interesting interpretation of what people have done and uh, how the model works, and not um, based on my opinion and understanding. So this is the content. Uh, the time I think it will be a little more on than that than this, but then we get a part. Uh, Creation, synthesis, and signal processing, mainly. And then another part will be about the analysis, timber, of levels, and every content. And um, as you can see on the, by the time I put there, it's like heavily front loaded. So if you feel like this is, um, um, like, I don't know, a bit overwhelming, it's okay. Uh, a lot of them, concepts and stuff could be new to you, but it will be at the end. Uh, the each section will get a little shorter and shorter again. So um, that's uh, I think <clears throat> something relief for you. All right. So now we are really going to start the talk. Uh, all you need is AI and music. <clears throat> so first, music AI. Well, what is music AI? I guess that's the the definition of music AI is one of the questions uh, any of us would have naturally. Here I will provide a very short, brief, and probably wrong, but useful definition. So let's say this machine is doing something musical as a response of some musical. So in this, according to this definition, if there's a software or a machine, a computer, outputting just random notes on and on, like so many, uh, we are not gonna call this AI because there's no reaction between us as a user of the AI and this AI um, instance. And here, what you see is a screenshot of a paper, the first, uh, the first page, which is a coming from ICMC conference, um, 1984. So, which is a while ago, I think like 37 years ago. Um, so, and then on the right, I also added uh, the block diagram from the paper down there. Performance. Uh, what you see here is that at, on the top left, we have the performance, which is the input of the 
I guess some piano player or keyboard, play, keyboard player. And then when the actual event stream is coming, the match, there's a match algorithm on the right. And then it do some comparison between what it gets the input the player's playing versus some expectation that it has made based on its knowledge. And based on that, at the end, as a result, it will output some automatic accompaniment. In detail of this uh, model, you will, if you look into this, like how this uh, Roger Denberg, um, AI machine or whatever you call uh, this real-time accompaniment software, the details will be probably very, very simple, right? It's uh, 1984, you can expect a lot of complicated for multi-layer perceptron. But for sure, one thing is that although inside of this box is really, really simple, what we see as a block diagram at a high level conceptual understanding. This is an example of a music AI because, uh, because according to my definition of today's talk, there are machines. It's a machine that doing something musical, which is uh, providing the anime as a response of uh, some musical input by us playing something. So I wanted to just uh, give you some um, sort of like extreme example where almost nothing else we think that uh, is, uh, is not there, but there is the most important thing, which is the, the definition, uh, of the definition, of doing something musical as a response. And there are a lot more uh, if you, after the I think, final exam, um, if you're interested in, you can check out the reference section. And there you see, of course, even older papers from like 1980, for example, and they are all, uh, the titles sounds like something that can be fully publishable these days as well, because um, the concept remains the same. It's just the implementation and the methodology that changes over time. So <clears throat> there was an example, an interesting example of music AI. Yeah, and but to see the field and the models uh, with a little bit more um, easier understanding um, for those who are not in the field, I made up this um, table, which is a uh, very simple. On the left, on the first column, you see the input could be either signal or information. And then on the <clears throat> column names, you see also information and signal, which is output. So for example, in the very, very first uh, cell, signal in and the information out, which is analysis. So that would be like, that means um, the music signal comes and then this model or computer AI does something um, like, for example, genre classification or musical similarity and computation and estimation. And I will call them analysis. And then we can move on to the right where, uh, where which is a, which is corresponds to signal input and signal output. So that I call audio signal processing. And this is a, uh, this, this is kind of like the very traditional definition of a signal processing. Like we get input and then it does something, it does something and then output the signal down. So for example, automatic mixing or music source separation could be an example, examples of a audio signal processing. And we can put down there on the left. So information in, information out. Well, information, the word is a little bit yes, less clear than what it's not, but we will uh, do this. Uh, do this anyway. anyway, information in, information out. That's a creation, for example, automatic composition or lyric generation. And finally, information in, then we get signal out. So we put some information, and as a, re as a response, the AI uh, gets us some signal. So that's an uh, audio system. So the example is a same voice generation or instrument sound synthesis. And the first, very first section in detail would be about audio synthesis. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> as a, there's, I'm gonna now talk about a bit of background knowledge and uh, that we hope you can understand the music AI in synthesis category. So first background synthesizer. Uh, which looks like this. Um, lots of things there. Obviously, you see some piano-like 
keyboard input there, and a lot of other things as well on the top. So it looks complicated, and it is complicated. It is a, also a, I believe, super beautiful, important invention in the history of music. Anyway, uh, for us, what matter? We can, I think, abstract it a little to um, toward understanding what it is. Um, I'll call just like, let, let's say first, uh, let's see first the key part again. So there are keys. Uh, what do we what do we do with the keys? We play, right? And by playing, what we are doing is actually giving the signal about what is the pitch that I am interested in to generate to the synthesizer. So this is a, we are inputting uh, the pitch information to the synthesizer. So that's what it is, keys to control the pitch. And then second, we see like 30, 40 different knobs and um, lots of interfaces there, up there on the panel. So what it does is uh, to control, I call it many knobs to control the timbre, or you can also think of it like control the tone or control the sound itself. Uh, and then finally, usually on the top right, there's a one special knob which corresponds to the output volume of the inside. So again, there are many things we can do. There are so many um, knobs and interface we have when you buy a new synthesizer, but they are just one, always one of the, this, one of the three um, functions, keys to control the pitch or knobs to control the timber or volume knob to control the volume. So what kind of sound we can make with the synthesizer? We will quickly uh, listen to this 12 seconds signal to video. consists of a sort of like typical synthesizer sound, but there are a lot more sounds, including some traditional uh, sounds of a traditional instrument that synthesizer can um, make successfully. Again, we have uh, this synthesizer, which if we write a paper about synthesizer, we will, you know, we need a block diagram. So, and this is the block diagram I will draw. We'll bring input and this machine, and then as a result, you get the sound yeah, you want. So that was the, my very short talk about the synthesizer. Now we are gonna move on to also a very, very short, uh, super brief introduction about the, one of the basic concept in acoustics. Three components of sound is not strictly loudness, pitch and timber, but it's a very similar. And I think this, uh, this way of uh, this perspective is more interesting to us for today's talk. So <clears throat> loudness is a loudness, but it is also a um, scientific term, <clears throat> which is defined as a, the loudness human perceive. So it is about some subjective measure rather than some number that we can measure with the like SPL meter. And pitch is the pitch, um, I guess you know what it is. And the rest, why the rest? So here the focus, my focus will be on Timber. Let's see the first bullet uh, point, timber. So this is uh, unlike the previous um, brief definitions that I made up, this is a real definition, scientific definition provided by Acoustical Society of America. Um, I think, I believe this uh, definition has been there for like at least 30, 40 years. Uh, it's a little long, but let's say in this way. Um, we know what pitch is. Pitch is what, uh, what about the, the, how we, the, it's like high or low pitch, this thing is just very straightforward and loudness I already explained to you. But then timber is not, I can't really explain this is timber. According to this uh, definition, which I admire a lot, uh, timber is defined as a something not. Let's say there are two different sounds. We know they are different sounds. Like 
we we listen and that we it's just sound different to us. And there could be many different reasons, but if those two sounds have the exactly same loudness and pitch, and still it sounds different to us. Um, there must be a reason, right? There must be some attributes that makes this sound sounds different to us. Uh, and all, all of that, like any attribute that can give us, give us that sort of a perception and it make us, it make us um, be able to distinguish the difference of two sounds is timber. Um, yeah, so that's the, what the definition says. If, um, on, I mean, it's a little more scientific term, attribute of auditory sensation enables a listener to judge that two non-identical sounds similar present in the same loudness and pitch are too similar. Okay, very cool. So that means we can break down um, sound into three different components, as I did, uh, as we perceive, loudness, pitch, and the rest. And in that sense, it makes total sense to, again, to have uh, this block diagram with synthesizer, right? Because now, is is the pitch knobs to timber and volume knob. This three way categorization is not arbitrary, but based on the based on how we perceive sound. Finally, another background, the last item of background on my encoder. I think I uh, believe this was already covered somewhere in the lecture. Well, so what it does is a very quickly um, to very quickly, we have input data, in this case, a times 28 by 28 uh, image. And, and then this autoencoder, we have a module one, which is encoder, another, another module, module two, which is encoder of the autoencoder. All in all, we have this um, encoder decoder structure, and usually it is trained to reconstruct the uh, input, right? So that's what it means. Uh, in some sense, we can see it's compressing and decompressing. Although sometimes it is not compression. In this case, um, the 784 pixels once they come 16 dimension vector and then um, decompress to reconstruct um, 784 pixel data again. All right, so those three things synthesizer and the sounds, the three components of sound and the autoencoder, when they are merged together, uh, the concept are, um, are mingled together. The author of DDSP made this structure, which we can understand based on those things, three things that I explained. So the title is a DDSP, Differential Digital Signal Processing. It's, um, I think two years ago, yeah, uh, I clear paper. It is target audio, encoder, decoder, something, 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 yellow, green, Red boxes somewhere like dotted. It's a bit complicated. So let's do some simplification. Um, I mean, it's an amazing work. Uh, they did a lot of things in the paper, and at the end, they had to create, I guess, this a uh, little bit uh, complicated illustration, which is great, but it is over complicated to us. So, um, first, let me explain it in a way that I mean, these are just the result of the synthesizer on the top normal sound and the noise sound. So that's how uh, they model the synthesizer, the two separate signal, and then merge together, and then real version is added. But it is less important to us uh, in terms of understanding DDSP as a deep learning um, AI music. So we will just, um, yeah, right. Um, and also, uh, and then there's this F0 estimation. I want to correct this. Uh, or better understanding of the structure because the F0, which is a pitch, by the way, um, is a, not exactly because of in very strict definition, they're a little different, but it is about pitch. And the pitch estimation is not part of the deep learning module in order, but it is a, they use the pre trained net uh, prepared by um, actually Jungo Kim, who's an alumni of NIU. Um, so yeah, they use the pre-trained model. So that doesn't deserve the red box. It deserves um, gray box, as they did. And, or we can just extract it even further and then just call them. There's some pitch recognition happening. 
the pitch recognition of the input sound and the information is passed to the decoder. Same things happening is the same box, but just for the sake of the consistent, consistency, I would call it loud and recognition. And finally, those three things that happens after generation from the decoder doesn't really matter. Don't matter that much, so I'll just call them post processing. And they don't even, these are polyps, I mean, it's great. All right, so now it is a lot simplified. And then, um, so indeed, what's happening here is that there's input sound, there are output sound, there's output sound. It is a actually autoencoder structure, so it tries to recreate the input sound. Input sounds is usually monophonic, one instrument sound, one sample, so usually just one single note of a like one, one of the many instruments that they have in the dance. So it's like two second, uh, two second audio, and the one note again, and that is reconstructed the output sound. So it's an autoencoder, and then what you see also here is that there's a pitch recognition module. The information about pitch of the input sound is passed to the decoder on the bottom. The loudness recognition is happening, and that is also um, that information is also passed to the decoder. So what we have left, what else we need? Of course, the timbre, right? According to the definition, and also in practice, what's happening is that non-timber information is computed and delivered to the decoder. And we have this trainable module, encoder and Z, the vector, the stream, actually the frame of vector, and the stream of the vectors, um, have to uh, deliver some information so that the decoder could reconstruct the input audio as much as possible, like of encoder. To do that, it has to have include some information about timber, because um, that is what timber is. So, and then here we see the obvious um, analog between the typical compiler and the DSP recorder. Each the keyboard, keyboard and then Z uh, corresponds to the many, many nodes you see up there. And then the volume knob, same as the loudness recognition. And then at the end, we see the synthesizer here with the sound. In other words, we can think, we can see it in this way. DSP decoder is a synthesizer. Uh, we need to control this synthesizer with the keys and many knobs and volume knob. How we do this? We we do it by controlling the pitch and loudness by the recognition module, and then we let the encoder model the sound, understand the sound, and give the right Z, uh, which which includes the timbre. Or we also we can call it it's like how we should. Uh, Control the many, many knobs on the synthesizer to generate the input sound again. Yeah, and uh, so the core idea of DDSP has nothing to do with the pitch and loudness. It, they just, they're just essential information, but they don't really need to be, uh, in their case, they don't really need to be modeled and estimated by deep learning module. It is all about the timber understanding. So that, uh, that was a short talk about DDSP. And then, yeah, there was a lot of information. So I think we can try to get some fun demo out of it. But uh, to, so this demo is a really, 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 really cool. First, uh, before showing you the demo, I will make some a bit of modification to the typical the canonical DDSP implementation. So what we want to do is a tone transfer. Tone transfer is a, or you can see it as like transferring the timber of a certain instrument sound into something else. Like you play piano and then it changes to that electric piano sound, like for example, right? So we have to do that. That's what you see, that's so nice. And, but here in this demo, what we see is instead of electric piano, uh, we will want to generate saxophone sound. We just don't want to make the saxophone sound. We want to transfer some sound into saxophone sound. And to do that, first, we need a 
Right, there's uh, actually a little something that there. So yeah, and that is, this modification is what we need uh, from the canonical DSP to effectively do the con transfer. So what's happening here is that now everything's merged and I just named it now, not encoder decoder, but a saxophone synthesizer. Because now we have it, uh, now that it's merged in the data set, original DDSP, the data set has a, it's an synth, which consists of a, like quite a lot of different instrument sound, like piano, violin, like all the important um, electronic sound lead, as well as uh, like woodwind. But for this tone transfer to saxophone, we will only use the saxophone sound. So that's the number one item here. Use the saxophone data set to train a simplified DDSP. And after training, it has become, if it was successful, it has become saxophone synthesizer, right? And then what we do here is um, after training, we actually um, cut the connection from the input sound to the synth. We, so what we're gonna do is to just let the synthesizer keep the information about the timbre of saxophone, but we will still use the timbre on the pitch and loudness recognition module from the input audio. So let's say in this way, I sing something like da da da, and then we extract the pitch and loudness and pass it to the synthesizer while we're keeping the, all the different knobs, the values that is optimized to recreate saxophone sound. Then the la da da would become like, not my voice, but the saxophone sound, la da da, right? And does it really work? Yes, of course. Singing 
boys than the sisters. Names go free, yes, yes. In which you cross it, your money has been taken, he has laid inside a bell machine. <laughs> yeah, my pretty cool, right? Um, really nerd. And um, the, another, the last example is uh, this uh, even more recent paper, right? Uh, which is a real time audio uh, variation of a time quarter. So, the example I'll play two very shortly. One is a violin sound, and then we'll also uh, play how the violin sound is tone transfer to human voice. Amazing. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the final page for the audience synthesis, which is uh, again about getting information and then generate some signal based on the information. Right. So second part, we move on to creation, which is a uh, creation mm -hmm. information in information out. This disclaimer, this, of course, uh, the definition of the creation um, that I said, which is information in, information out, is a super narrow um, definition of a creation. For example, like singing itself is a creative activity, so I don't want to include it out of the creative part. But yeah, so but here is the definition of this uh, four way categorization. Again, the same idea. We want something, some way to steer the AI to use it for whatever you want, right? With the, so for example, we don't want to just create like many, many songs. We might want to have a query like, okay, write some song, but I want the genre of the song be jazz. And then the model, yeah, this is a bit better, yeah, than create some jazz music. And similar idea, we can give some prompt of the code progression, like, hey, so what about what would be the next code for them if the very first code provision is like D minus seven and G seven and uh, AI could uh, oh yeah do this do that. Finally, um, also a super popular topic when we have a melody, we want to have some nice accompaniment, uh, which would include the information of the chord and the rhythm, um, could be instrumentation, etc. And um, so to understand the creation part, we will talk a little bit about language models, uh, which is the topic we leave us. So you guys should just know everything that I will introduce. So I'll just, yeah, I'll be very quick. You know, things like that, mm -hmm. like broad embeddings, text summarization, and machine translation. So those kind of tasks. Uh, are quite similar in some sense to what we do in the music AI underscore um, creation. And that's because, um, because of the similarity that people have observed between music and language. Uh, is it really similar? Uh, that depends on how, like, where you, which aspect you focus on. If you want to point out the difference between music and language, there are yeah, endless number of things that they're different. But if we adopt this super simple definition of music and language, they are different things. So language, let's say language is a sequence of words, and let's say music is a sequence of notes. So we are, as a result, ignoring so many things like the timber, lyrics, culture, and stuff, on and on. Um, I'm not an expert of language, but I'm quite sure language is more something more complicated than sequence of words. But if we see it that way, then the sequence of words is just the same as sequence of notes, except the, I mean the vocabulary is a little different, the grammar will be different, but they are as a like um, as a uh, for the AI research point of view, uh, or for the AI who will just see the numbers and the token IDs. Um, they're the same thing. So based on that observation, this is a, a, a paper, short paper that I, I wrote um, five years ago, which is a, um, I chose this work, well, first because I did it, so I know what it is, I can get the MPG files. 
Also, this is a one of the I think only work meaning uh, the least great because uh, like it was the most like vanilla approach by adopting the language model to the music and just use it after replacing the data set from some real text input. Uh, text data set with a music data set. And in this case, it was a chord progression, which I just uh, tokenized with the, uh, every chord word into the different word. And then I had somehow had this uh, real book um, data. So after processing the stuff, we could get, we could train an RNM, or actually LSM, which is, which is LSTM, um, based on this real book data set. So, what we get as a result is that when we give them some prompt, the first chord progression, we could let the model just keep creating, uh, generating the chord progression as much as we want. And at the end, you can see how people like what collapse does it. So later, like I, later it just somehow start to only operating like C major, um, which is, it makes sense. Uh, and what you see here also is that uh, I made a bar in a red color, so, and so that means every um, every chord is a corresponds to each beat, um, so in four four. And we will play this short example uh, with a colored part chord progression. Um, if you can read understand the chord, you will you can confirm that they are the same thing. If you can't, you can just believe me. <laughs> uh, and also again, this model is about creating the chord progression, but I'm gonna play some audio uh, that like, I just simply very uh, briefly made based on the chord progression. short history of the progress in of music AI in this field is a RNN right arrow transformer right arrow transformer with relative attention so or, or different kind of variation and here the choice of transformer with relative attention uh, is the, the, the right decision the important decision the authors have made uh, to make it happen and make the result musically plausible and sounds good because um, by adopting relative attention, they could uh, let the model understand the, the difference between the current time step and the previous time step. And that matters because in music, lots of things, especially many rhythmic structure repeats over time. So we want uh, to make sure that that kind of idea is infused into the model in some sense. And the method, the approach to the authors I've chosen for that um, that aspect was a relative attention. So what you're also gonna see here is the, the here, I'm not sure how to work exactly, but it, like around here is the prompt, and then for the rest of the songs are the play or the notes um, are what the, the train model generated. And you because this is based on attention model, uh, we can we, they could also visualize uh, when each note is created where uh, what was the other note in the previous steps? The model attended the most to make the decision of that note. So, which you will see with the nice, beautiful circles.
So, um, and in their website on the blog post, you can check out the similar um, results, but with the without the relative attention, also with the think RNN. Uh, they are they they like the sound and harmony makes sense, but the rhythmic structure is totally collapsed much much earlier. Um, with transform like around the half over the half, then the trans the typical transformer sort of collapsed and forget about the rhythmic structure. RNN is a way worse. Um, yeah, and so that um, the first one is what we just saw a demo for. And then there are many other things. Uh, now what I see is that people realize, oh, we have we have done enough by just with uh, just simply adopting the language models, right? Um, also, people have write enough papers about that, so they can't write anymore. Um, with that, just yeah, someone already did it. So. For the sake of uh, solving the problem or writing paper, uh, yeah, people now are making a lot of uh, customization. And what, uh, like for example, in the pop music transformer, what's happening is that the model itself is uh, just very similar to transformer. But what they do, uh, where they uh, focus on, where they, the focus of this work is about how they encode the information that is meaningful in music into the world. So at the end, um, the MIDI transformer, MIDI VA, or some MIDI transformer, they, they all talk about like, put some MIDI-like representation, some discrete representation, uh, which has a pitch uh, or note information and like the duration and things like that, like the accent, those kind of note-based information in, into this uh, word representation. Something similar to what uh, you are familiar with in the language models, but it just also has some, not only the like single pitch or more like, but it has more information than that. And recently people realized, oh, probably we should also encode some um, notion of like where they are, where this note is like in the whole bar, where is like, is it in the first beat or second beat? Like things like that, is it beat and down beat or there's the bar, the there's a like boundary of the bar, right? And then those kind of, Understanding those, those kind of like structures of the whole model, all music um, is important information to put into the model so that as a result, uh, the model also still the model can even understand not only like the harmonies of the uh, music, but more like the structure, the rhythm. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the, the current. Um, direction that people are uh, tapping into. Finally, uh, the creation part also gives us um, some very interesting questions, uh, philosophical or sometimes even ethical questions. So first, uh, when you are like the research in the field, you, that uh, is when we re revisit the question of uh, how do we consume music? Like, how do we use music? Uh, there are more than just a typical situation Typical use case where we listen to music because we like it. Because, for example, the music can be used for like background music for the like videos or um, like all the way to generate the photo album, right? And there are different. Their purpose is different. And then there is also like background music in the cafe um, or any restaurant, any venue. So, or sometimes like you have some functional music. There's a music therapy. There are so many. Uh, I think. I just I put it there because uh, when we are thinking of the music creation as a problem that we want AI to solve, that is when we realize uh, the diversity of the motivation uh, to listen to music. So that's one thing. And then, as a music creator, we also uh, have to ask this question: like, Why do we make music? Because um, we want to make uh, the right boundary and define what. AI wants to do for us so that we can at the end write a good music for most of the time. Well, sometimes we just want the final result to use it for like background music again for the video. But for a lot of time, uh, music composers and music producers, they are also interested in uh, drawing the boundary so that still they want, they uh, almost feel like, and I think that they, they still want to own their music. They still want to have a full control of the music, but at the same time, they want to get some help from some new technology. 
um, which is the same thing that people have done in the history so far. And it's just that AI is becoming a new tool uh, that enables us, enable people a lot more things. And it's almost like too many things that they can do. And that is why now we want to throw, throw some like, bottom line. Like, don't touch this. I'm going to do this, but you do that. Um, and then when it comes to the training of the model to create the many songs, now it's a little different uses of um, different use case of uh, music, right? When we listen to music versus when we let this model listen to music, like millions of songs in, I don't know, like a day or two very quickly because they are fast, the GPUs are fast. And that is probably not the exactly uh, what we signed up for when we are um, when we are getting access to some music data set. Most of the time, there is a, sometimes it's written, the other time it's implicit, but there's a like rule of the copyright uh, law and then also at least in our ethical standard, we know that we, they provide us the music so that we can listen to music, not, you know, not so that uh, we can just let ingest the whole data set into the models to memorize everything and then create all the music based on that. That's a, uh, that like musicians really hate it, they hate the idea. Um, and I think I can see why, like, I mean, it's somehow, it's, it feel like musicians hate it because um, it's a, uh, they are, I think, feeling threatened uh, about their job security. And that's also honestly kind of fair <laughs> to some extent, but hopefully it's not used in like that. Hopefully, by democratizing the tools of AI and everything, we actually help them. So that's, um, that's anyway, that's a big question on this field as well. Finally, when you have this uh, output, who owns it? Uh, so the very, I think the most popular um, example of this question and answer about who owns a copyright of uh, some creature uh, made by like not human, but something else uh, is uh, the picture that this um, ape took, like, the yeah, or something. Yeah, there was a selfie. By yeah, the like gorilla was it? Gorilla yeah. or something, yeah. And that became so popular. And of course, the owner of the camera, who I think was a photographer, um, argued that it's his picture. But I think it went to like court and then there's a yeah, suit. So the, I think the animal rights group actually uh, yeah. sued the photographer, right? Yeah, because yeah, the, the, the argument was that he stole the copyright. Yeah, exactly. Of the <laughs> picture that he made uh, profit from it. Exactly. Does that make sense? <laughs> right? Uh, so that's uh, that question, which I think I saw like when I was young from news or something. It's just like some fun um, things happening around the world. Um, it's becoming a real question when it comes to the AI creation. So that was the music AI part. And the third one. Now we're going to move on to the audio signal processing. Here, the example task I chose is a music source separation. The concept is pretty straightforward. We get mixture music, or we can just call it music because every music that we listen to is a mixture. Uh, and through the uh, music source separation model, um, we get some separated output, for example, vocal only or drums only or guitar sound only. So that's the concept. And I'll directly go to the demo. So this is a, a demo made by my colleague last year, uh, Chu Chang um, in China. He, in this demo, he put the mixture of this song and then I think I'll continue first and then voice. Uh, so yeah, let's see if I remember correctly. Something that musicians hate so much. 
much because <laughs> they don't want us to listen to like that specific music uh, instrument like this. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so after demo, let's talk about the models a little bit. I'll make some comparison between what we used to do traditionally prior to deep learning era. At that time, which is only like five, six years ago, um, we have to make so many assumptions to the job and still we are not doing as well as what you have just uh, listened to. Uh, uh, so now I'm gonna read everything. They just have to have a lot of assumptions, like for example, for vocal source separation. Usually in stereo signal, vocals are mixed at the center. So then we could like do something. Uh, I mean, not, it's not usually as simple as just like left minus right signal or something, but it's basically the same idea, but with a little bit more sophisticated approach. The problem is at the center, uh, I mean, that's kind of true, but not strictly, because first, Vocals are mixed on the other part as well, especially if the, even if there's only one main vocal, usually there are uh, music producers add some reverberation, which spread the whole vocal sound into the whole stereo point left to right. And so it's everywhere, not only in the center. Also at the center, uh, the center is not only for vocals. The center is for some other stuff, including usually snare sound of drums. If you don't know a snare sound, snare sound is the loudest sound in the drums or maybe the whole, uh, among the whole instrument in terms of the waveform and everything. So the snare is like, boom, bah, it's the snare sound. <laughs> and that's always at the center, which means when we extract the vocal from the center, like imagine the same musical, if um, they want the excerpt and then we extract the vocal, and then the singers are singing, and there's almost nothing else but a snare sound. It's so annoying. It's, you, you can't, you can't, you can't just, it's just the, the many applications of the vocal social creation is up. Well, sometimes karaoke creation, but the other times it's also used for like, uh, to just extract so that people can remix um, and make much more fun. Also another like kind of interesting music based on the extracted sound. Yeah, but if there's a snare, there every time it's almost like useless. So that's just something you fail one use one case of the failures, but there are so many assumptions like that. Uh, none of them are perfect assumption, and because of that, we couldn't really uh, make use of the source separation technique until the set. But now we are living in a deep learning era. Uh, things are much more. The assumptions became a lot simpler. Uh, it's uh, honestly, it's more than this. But uh, besides this, it's about uh, those, assu those assumptions are hidden when we're designing the network structure. For example, if we use convolution-based UNet, then those uh, specification of the networks, like receptive size of the receptive field or something like that, would uh, we can interpret those things, those uh, network structure into some assumptions that we are we could without realizing that. But those are really minor compared to the assumptions that we used to make, used to make a while back. Um, now, I think the biggest assumption is whether we want to use the phase of the sound uh, or not, uh, which I'm not going to cover the details, details about, but this, like, all in all, the trend is clear. Uh, following the spirit of the deep learning, we are removing assumptions more and more and doing really good job with the music source separation. If we are doing so well that now we, it's almost time to rethink the validity of the problem itself. So, which is such a luxury, I would say, that we can even ask this kind of philosophical question as a researcher, uh, the problem about the problem itself. So we are now assuming when we are solved, trying to solve the music source separation, we are assuming that instruments have unique sound, we can distinguish them, machine can distinguish them as well. Um, and also we're assuming some discretization of the instrument, classic. for example, violin, like viola and cello, like we are saying that, oh, they are really different to each other. And for classical or like traditional instruments, yes, maybe. Um, but then because we are living in a deep era, and 
a lot of songs are created with a synthesizer. And when we are using a synthesizer to create music, we people just don't simply name it the existing instrument. People want to create new songs. So that makes a whole new instrument category for every song. And that again means we can't really first define even target, even we can't even define the target instrument because we don't know what will be there. So it's a it's a, it's a for researchers like us. It's a big question uh, of the future direction. Like, okay, we are probably almost not gone, but like we are really doing well with the like, drums, vocals, and pianos, and like bass guitar. But then we realize, oh, we can't really, uh, with this existing philosophy and um, approach, we can't really solve um, the separation of the synthesizer sound, for example, because, um, because there are undefinable. Like we, they are not defined like we used to define those traditional instruments. So that's um that's a big question now. And besides the source separation, there are quite a few other applications in audio signal processing. So here I put um, categorize a little. So in under the name of the enhanced frequency signal, we have source separation, speech enhancement, and reverberation. And then uh, so those are like very typical examples. Usually also we share this problem with the speech field because um, we, I want to like extract vocals and drums, but speech people, um, they want to enhance the audio quality of the phone call, for example. Um, so yeah, and then the same idea with the just different data set are that all the directly used uh, for different kind of problems under the enhanced privacy. And then we have uh, automatic mixing and mastering also effects. Uh, which we will see the demo in the next slide. So these three are something uh, not everyone do, everyone does in their daily um, life. It's a very specific, special uh, task that music producers have to do. And on that field, also the neural net has been really well. And finally, voice conversion. All right, so the next uh, page, we have this demo. So it's uh, like one minute and then, um, and it's kind of long. It's uh, it actually the video was uploaded yesterday, <laughs> meaning I made this uh, slide after yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I made it last week, but like edited this page today. Um, it's a very interesting example. Uh, what it does, what the author did is um, they trained a model, uh, TCM, which is a super popular structure for uh, page signal. And they train the model so that, I mean, he's going to explain. I'll just add a little more. Um, say the model can now model learn a mapping from signal before and after. And the before and after, the difference could be just could be adding reverberation, maybe compression, just lots of different things or delay, echo effect, lots of effects of whatever it is. And let the model learn it from this one pair of the sound. And then, uh, in the model, there's a controllable uh, value. Uh, you can you can set as many as you want. They said two. Um, so there are two values, C1 and C0, um, which is used uh, to condition the network. And during the training, they set the conditioning to be just zero, and then the default value. And then after training, they just change the value to see what is happening. So it's kind of like somehow, Random. We don't really know when we change the value. What is going to happen exactly? Um, still, it's a it's a very fun topic. So, yeah. So I've been talking. So after this, we will spend I think another like thirty minutes or less maybe. So yeah, take a maybe short break with the like watching one minute plus video.
don't change as much as possible, even if the pitch changes, if the sound is the same. And that is why, for example, MCC is used for speech recognition. So let's say I say some word like, um, like, like I say like music, and um, and speech recognition model. If I say music, 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 it's just the same word, right? So it has to be able to capture the word, which uh, based on some computational understanding, even if the pitch was totally different. So and that so that's why they want that MCC this thing um, this idea this concept to be a uh, pitch environment and for the similar motivation uh, we do a little bit of tweaking of the computing MCC people usually remove the first value of the MCC and well they do it because people do it people also follow doing it. Sometimes they don't know why, but the reason is because the first value of MCC vector represents the loudness of the, not exactly the sound loudness, but how loud the sound is. So that means, again, like, again, speech recognition. I might say music, or it's the same music, right? So the value is probably not exactly the same, but still very similar. And yeah, with a good reason, because that is the property, the loudness invariant is also the property we want to have. And as a result, uh, the way we're using it is that it's originally designed for speech signals, but widely used for music as well. And the reason is because, as I just explained, MFCC has all the good properties that we need in music information retrieval as well. For example, when we are computing like when you're doing genre classification, MCC is useful because we want the model, the, this is the classifier, uh, to work regardless of the slight volume change of the music or like the same rock music. If you play the exactly same song, one key higher, still it's a rock music, right? So we want the classifier to be invariant to the pitch changes or loudness changes. And that is uh, remind me of the uh, three concept sound, right? It is designed to be pitch invariant, and they people in, uh, purposely and intentionally remove the first coefficient, which is the loudness related part. And according to the three concept of sound, well, what we have left, which uh, obviously timber, so that means that gets us a conclusion that, all right. MCC is all about timber. And okay, so that was the, this is the, yeah, this so far we talked about MCC. Now let's come back to the current age and talk about confidence. You know what it is, right? The, the, I don't know, car, non car detector, uh, maybe some numbers. This, this figure is a little weird. It's an A, but I'll put. So this 10, so <laughs> you don't even tell it alphabet from A to whatever, only 10 alphabets, which is a little weird. But I've never thought about that actually. I've, I've, I've seen this figure right? out probably like millions of times. Exactly, you know. exactly. Some made a huge mistake. <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah, the Yana yeah. now, yeah, the Yana couldn't be, apparently. Yes. <laughs> oh, Yana did it? Yeah, this oh is Jan's flow, actually. Oh, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, this is yeah, such an important finding. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, this is really funny. Um, so Comlet, we use it a lot. Um, it's great. And why is it great? Let's uh, talk about the property of Comlet. There are so many properties, but I think the most important property is a classifier and feature extractor is that uh, when we are designing and developing a text recognition model or object recognition model, we want the model working in this way that even if the text is blurred or regardless where it is, like the alphabet could be on the top, the bottom, and the left, we still want the model to do the job. And it's a kind of similar situation. We just said, even if the volume is a little low or a little high, and oh, also regardless of the key or pitch of the sound, uh, 
we think, for example, genre classification should work um, with the being invariant of those kind of chains. So, okay, sounds pretty similar, right? And it's a, uh, it can be, I can't really say it's very exactly like identical because um, for object recognition, um, basic convex is a, a like too sensitive to texture. So, in that sense, it's a very similar between texture and image. Is a timber of the sound when you see the spectrum of the sound of some sound of music sound, uh, music audio. But yeah, it's uh, not exactly the same because I guess for the image, they still want to capture the uh, outlines, where in music spectrogram is less about the outline. But the idea is the same, still remains. It is about timber, and that is why confidence is useful for us as well. Um, and here, I just wanted to reiterate some very important points. So people, I think there's a, this like, uh, I think this misconception is too popular that yeah, people have addressed it already many times, but neural network is not, artificial neural network is not exactly about a human nervous system. Also human nervous system is not about artificial neural network. And also combat the same. Combat was inspired, motivated by uh, the way we see, the way we process the bigger um, information of the brain. But at the end, they're not exactly the same. And also, what's common is not about like, vision. We are using it for vision tests because of the properties that components have. Uh, components have are very useful for that solving that task. But that doesn't mean component is like, um, limited to the some optimization for vision related tasks and vice versa, right? Vision also now is a transform as feature is fully deployed for the vision task as well. And instead, I think we should see in this way that component is designed to be sensitive to something, some aspects, not gonna be comprehensive here, but components are designed to be sensitive to something while insensitive or invariant to some others. And somehow, when we are working on music analysis, when especially when we are like, doing some classification or recognition task, like genres or mood, um, or instrument, there that uh, similarity and the property of the component means we can totally use it, uh, and the property of this component totally suitable for the model that we want to have when it comes to music analysis. And that is why components are so popular um, in the with tagging or with classification problems. So this is a, yeah, uh, one of the five years ago, my paper, uh, where I did really nothing but borrowing VGNet and then applied it to the, the, the biggest existing public data set, million some data set. So this is a spectrogram, um, like frequency and time, and it's an input, one channel and goes to the VGNet architecture, and then we yeah, make a uh, classification to all of these 50 uh, head candidates. And after this paper, um, yeah, there has been, there were already some papers, and after that, now so many new classification papers are either component-based or at least partially component-based because of the purpose. So those um, the uses of component is not limited to hacking, which is uh, actually an umbrella task for general classification and mode recognition. Um, they are more like instrument recognition and also similar to learning. Lots of things that, as long as it is about timber understanding, and um, we yeah the component for music has been uh, has been used for adopted and achieved state of the art performances uh, over the last I think. Uh, Five six years. So, and what is interesting here is that I already mentioned repeatedly in this section only that combat music and timber. What's really fun is that um, is, um, no one really talks about that. No one really seriously in the community in the research field. People don't really talk about what it does. Where out of this uh, aspect, what this model is focusing on, but. So that's what I meant when I say no one has declared what we are doing is about timber understanding. But somehow many people propose the model as if it's a timber task, and that is how it works. 
And um, maybe this uh, component, by adopting component, we are, we might be missing something. We are, uh, because component is not, component has good properties, of course, but um, I don't know, maybe it's not uh, only about timber, because um, also when it comes to like musical understanding, music classification, genre classification, um, timber, when I say timber, it kind of like disregard, disregard the fine grain information about which note there is, for example, what is a chord. It's about the, a lot of the sound it is, uh, itself. So that means by adopting component only, we are probably ignoring something, some aspect of music when you're solving the job. The, problem, the thing is, we're overlooking, we are overlooking it because component have worked very well. Uh, so the performances have justified the adoption so far, but that doesn't mean we are going to use content only. And uh, there will be, I think, more um, interesting approach in the future that involves uh, understanding something more than timber to do the same job. And so I just said timber might be not everything. At the same time, while only because I uh, worked on this problem and and thought about it and been thinking about why it works and what it's doing exactly. I realized surprisingly, timber is so important, so, so important that with almost timber only, we could still achieve like really high accuracy for lots of uh, MIR tasks. So that's, um, that gave us an idea that it is a concept that uh, governs our musical preference and musical perception a lot more than we think, we think we do. And uh, yeah, now move on to the second uh, section, note left understanding. As I predicted, we are getting, the sections are getting shorter, so. Uh, right, so note level understanding. There are a couple of different tasks. First, F0 estimation. So this is the, when the input audio is monophonic, so not a mixture, multiple instrument, or many notes played together. But when it's like, for example, no other signal, but like I am singing, for example, and then it's like, oh, there's, we can then extract the fundamental frequency of the melody of the voice. I'm, I'm the, the example, as you see on the bottom of the figure there. Second task, another task uh, is a melody extraction. Similar idea, but uh, to F series question, except when he's saying melody extraction, we are talking about the melody of the whole like popular song. And that means uh, there are different instruments like could be piano, guitar, bass, drums, and the vocal together. And there could be also multiple, you know, vocal harmony, right? This which is really common. Sometimes, uh, not most of the time, like people agree that with the single answer, uh, when they ask, when they're asked about it, what is the melody of this song, which is so interesting, right? No one really told us what is melody, but we have this intuition. Uh, but, but some other times, it's rare, but um, there are some music where people have like quite a few different ideas about what is the melody of the song. Even, if, even like, I mean, also one can easily create Super confusing song in terms of melody, right? Like just the same volume, but different melody goes on and on together at the same time. But then that's, but even without it, intending it, some songs have a fuzzy concept of melody. And somehow the definition of melody is very subjective. So that makes the problem quite different from the F0 estimation. Finally, the transcription, uh, which is uh, creating out of the audio. So, and that's, uh, yeah, the problem can be further defined by the quality of timing as well. The piano, it could be drums, it could be like the violin. Um, and then also for sure, it, it, it gets more difficult when the input audio is a mixture versus just a single, uh, single instrument signal. So that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of the explanation of the tasks in note level of understanding. And we'll put, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about transcription. So transcription research before deep learning, like similar to the source separation, uh, 
we had uh, many papers, um, many papers, many researchers work on this problem, but it was really difficult. At the end, people ended up like tweaking the method on and on and on and on and on, like endlessly, like, like iPhone. <laughs> and that was not only a good thing because, um, because, uh, so there's this thing, for example, say there's this very famous data set, transcription data set. And back then the data set was not even that big. So say it's like 10 some, 20 some transcription. Real story, not like 100 or 300. We really had like small data set. Um, you try very hard and you study something about the signal processing and machine learning and uh, whatever it is. Then you just invent so many methods with the equations maybe, and then try that with the single experience experiment because you're a um, PhD student and like trying like 20 different approaches. Finally, this method work uh, outperformed the, the previous uh, best performances, right? Um, which is good. Now you write the paper, it's accepted because it's working well. And for sure, especially if you're an experienced researcher, you can come up with the justification for any equation that you make up, if that you made, if if it performed well, right? It's like, hey, uh, the like the piano notes, for example, like let's say you model the score, the distribution of notes with the sum graph. So like, hey, this graph model is uh, intuitively like correct because um for sure when when you're writing song, this like this relationship, like harmonic relationship, for example, exists, right? And so this thing thing, yeah, like this has a high probability because of that. And as a result, um it shows better preferences. We never say there are like 19 failure approaches and only <laughs> display one success approaches, um successful approaches. So at the end, like over time, the academia, we have a stack of like so many methodologies. Uh, with the one single data set has like 20 songs, for example. So that's basically what was happening before deep learning era. Uh, not at the very beginning, but at some point, I think we were like over optimizing or almost like, I can say, overfitting to the specific data set without realizing that we are overfitting. Or um, thankfully, after deep learning, um, not only deep learning, but also because we had a huge, much, much bigger data sets, we could um, more correctly evaluate the models and then that also develop nice, interesting um, models. The modules in this uh, successful transcription models are typical combat and, and RNS, but we had, uh, and then only with the combat RNN and combat RNS, we are, uh, models, we were making like progress until like 2018. But then we had this uh, innovative approach named onsets and frames, again by the proxy Google. So this is the architecture, which is a, uh, yeah, all right, but I'll just give some, again, simplification for their understanding. There's a log mass spectrogram, which looks like that. And there's a one module, we call it onset model. Um, after onset modeling, we get some onset. And then another module that takes input not only from the audio, but also from the output of the onset module one. And finally, we get this frame. So what is onset and frame? So when we are transcribing some music signal, what we do is first, usually, uh, we need to find like which notes, right? On which timing. And also we need to find how long it is played. So onset uh, have onset means when we exactly like push like play it, but then frame means how long it lasts. And so that's and what's really interesting is that first there what we learned from the success of the onset and frames approach is that although the information was already all there in the score, because we made this model in structuring this way, first predicting onset and then using the condition, the frame model, and also training it um, separately, first from the first for the onset and then frame. And that means loss function computed separately. That kind of design these choices help to get a better performance. Yeah, 
So that's uh, that's the takeaway lesson. And this is a little history of this, a very brief history of the first question models. And it comes to F1 score. It's not exactly correct because I was totally confused with the all different metrics and the way of evaluation. But what's happening is that before um, before deep learning, uh, like the health at all is the one of the deep learning method, ever uh, 2016 is not. And somehow deep learning was all right, but then with onset and frames, now we are achieving a lot of performance. The most like uh, recent approach, uh, the state of the art is now getting 97% F1 score uh, for piano transcription, which is, uh, which is amazing. Yeah, right. So I'm gonna play this uh, demo video by Kwon Taegyun in Kais in Korea. It's, um, so he's playing it, obviously. So, so, so he plays piano and then there's a microphone which takes the sound and then the laptop performed the analysis, uh, the transcription and then the result is going to be displayed uh, as a piano roll, uh, which you will see. in transcription. But then there's this new thing, which is very interesting. I mean, that's why I did it. <laughs> so I'm biased with him yep. <laughs> together. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know how to play drum myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the same author of the content of friends, what they did here uh, is the very cool thing. Uh, they trained the synthesis, synthesis module along with the transcription module using the pair signal and the, of the piano and the MIDI so that they're basically training a WebNet. Um, and the idea is that if we synthesize the piano correctly, then if we resynthesize the audio signal from MIDI, they should be similar if they're correct, right? So it's a kind of, again, kind of like autoencoder, uh, wave, wave in, wave out. Uh, in, the, in the intermediate, there's a MIDI, is a, which is a latent representation of this audio. Um, I did, we did something similar. What we did is though a little different. Uh, we wanted to do it with audio only, no character, no transcription, and no label, for answer label. And later, you, the approach was followed by guitar and piano. So how we did, we did this, which is uh, to complicate it again. So I'm gonna do simplification again. There's a transcription module, there's synthesized, synthesized, synthesis module. The synthesis module is not think about deep learning, it's just a torch based implementation of the sound synthesizer. So, what's happening is that if, again, the same idea, if the drum transcription works well there, the synthesized audio should be. Uh, Similar enough to the input audio. Oh yeah, right. So it's again auto encoder. Here we could on, we only relied on the audio on the signal, audio data set. We didn't have, we didn't use, uh, we didn't even have a structure uh, for the drum uh, signals that we use. But because of this logic, it won't. So this is an yeah, example of auto encoder. Okay, now I'm gonna discuss a little bit about transcription. So far, I mentioned the piano and drums, and it was not just like coincidence uh, that I chose two. Actually, those two are probably the only two instruments that we are successfully um, transcribing with the machine learning models. And that's because um, that is related to the fact that it's very much easier to create realistic data sets. So the virtual instrument um, with the MIDI keyboard <coughs> Can get can make uh, make us enable us to generate really really realistic piano signal even at just home and same same thing goes on for drums. So for all the recent drum uh, transcription models are based on the data set uh, made with the MIDI drum, but they are realistic enough. So 
But the problem is that besides piano and drums, it's really hard to find such instruments that um, can easily create the realistic audio signal by MIDI playing. So that's that related to the uh, so the nature is that and right so I mentioned here large data set of all MIDI based synthetic ones. And same thing, but in a different from a different perspective. Uh, there are no such easy way to synthesize or create those audio signals with the MIDI uh, keyboard and virtual instrument because, because the companies who are developing those uh, tools and software couldn't make a good ones because it's really difficult. Why is it difficult? Because uh, unlike piano or drum, which like just like, Tap and then that's it. Uh, like saxophones, for example, or string instruments, it's really, really, uh, you know, sensitive and dynamic and changing over time depending on how you play. And that is so hard to model. Because it's hard to model, uh, there's no good virtual instrument. Because there's no good virtual instrument, we can't create large data set. And as a result, we can't develop a good transcription modules. So, yeah, and even worse. Sometimes it's like, okay, now I'm talking about again okay, problems with the problems. Like for electric guitars, for the music that DJs are creating, um, they don't care about care a bit about um, transcription. They don't even know how to transcribe their own music. Uh, there's no score. It's like in the whole like creation process from those kind of music along the uh, creation process of those kind of music, score never exists. So that's, uh, I think that's a like, super fundamental limitation of the problem itself that uh, as a means of uh, understanding for the music. So the transcription doesn't work, doesn't need it, probably doesn't need it at all for some kind of music. And even for the kind of instrument that we want to transcribe, like violin, saxophone, uh, first, not only is hard to do, but also let's say we there are like hundred instruments that we can actually transcribe meaningfully. That means we have to develop hundred different transcription models. That sucks. Uh, we are not we are not facing the problem yet, but I think we will see the problem pretty soon, and then that is when I think we are we will want to then work on this multi-task problem, one model for solving many different instruments. Finally. Again, for the synthesizers, there's no clear boundary between instruments. So that is also another big uh, homework for the future researchers. Okay, there are one more section. But this is really short because um, theory understanding. A very some short summary is that we are not doing a lot of work in theory understanding. <laughs> uh, one popular problem though is uh, Lyric alignment, which is a uh, like yeah, you sing it. We have lyric text data set. We just align it um, so that we can let the karaoke machine follow and tell us where we should sing. So that's the very uh, the number one, and it might be the only application for that. But that's a very popular and useful in the real world already. So I know like many companies have deployed developed and deployed this. And just uh, yeah, uh, there's a we call it sequence alignment or sequence matching. It's a that as a machine learning problem is just so popular that there are so many methods you can borrow and use it. So that's the thing. Uh, finally, lyric transcription. We want it. We don't know what that is. Method is there. I think we can just do it as long as we can. Uh, that problem, the pro progress is really slow. Finally, conclusion. I showed you this four way categorization, uh, which I somehow invented during preparing this talk. And in the categorization and also in, during the explanation of this model, I sometimes borrowed, um, mentioned the concept of the compound of sound, about this pitch and timber. That, um, yeah, that's a uh, that's not the typical way people explain the models that I uh, covered today, but I think as a music researcher, also 
to study the acoustic. I think that's an important aspect and will make you understand the model much easier. And uh, what do I need more? Um, yeah, I nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I think we've been borrowing models from different domains a lot, but now's the time I think, um, to really have some specialized models. I mean, I already covered some of them, right? Like pop music transformer like to create pop modules. They have notion of the bars and rhythms. So things like that, I think is important. Also, I just told you for layer uh, transcription, data sets are small, but maybe, maybe if the real world doesn't give us a big data set, probably the researchers should just embrace the reality and then try to come up with the uh, solution that can solve the problem with a small size data set. Uh, oh, the last one is that, you know, these days like sleep, for example, GPT, a lot of things are done with the data set that were crawled from the web. And it doesn't really work like that in music. First, crawling is illegal and um, a lot more illegal than other fields. They're illegal. <laughs> um, yeah, but at the same time, there's a one hope. Unlike text, speech, or like image, video, music creation process is really nicely digitized. Uh, well, I said uh, it's, we don't have like good uh, BSD process on the stuff, but we that's about like player's perspective. We still have a good virtual instrument that can sound really nice. Um, nice sounds of the old instrument we know. So that means I am thinking maybe instead of uh, other people in other fields crawling a lot of data from internet, we should just synthesize a lot um, because it's easier and it's an option for us. So that was the uh, yeah. idea. And if you like music AI, yeah, you can check out these conferences. Um, Izmir and Creative Workshop in New York. I think there was an ICML too, maybe not, but there was a music discovery workshop in ICML, so that will be useful too. I guess SMC, all useful. Finally, the, this year's Izmir, we had a lab showcase, which you can see there. You can just Google it. Uh, there's like 34 different research labs all around the world who are working on music at least one of them. Sometimes they are the music. So they're, yeah. So that's um, I guess good source of information if you want to go, I don't know, grad school and then to start some interesting journey of amazing research. Right, that was it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, the title, all you need is music and I'm done. I was good, so thank you. A fascinating lecture. To, uh, I think everyone was just listening really, really absolutely. Oh, just uh, one thing. Uh, it turned out the reason why there there was A in the figure was because uh, Leon Botin actually just uh, messaged me saying that they, it's because they trained a model to do the digit recognition, but using both the characters and uh, the letters and the digits, and then they just took out the letters they got. So it was a multitask learning. But anyway, okay, so apparently they work better on the check recognition. So anyway, so uh, we do have time for just one question. Is there any question? Uh, all right, there you go. Um, it might be kind of a two-part, but I'm wondering if um, in the music creation section, have you been able to, or have you observed models that are able to discover kind of new harmonies that aren't really that used? Like, a lot of the predictions that you showed are really kind of couched in like Western music theory, two by one, stuff like that. Are you observing that these models are able to like pick up new things or come up with new harmonies that just aren't part of the canon? Uh, yeah, right. You're of course correct that I just a very canonical canon progression there. Uh, in terms of code progression, I First of all, I don't really know, but I don't think there will be a lot of new things in terms of that. Um, because um, I think to have a new novel combination in harmony or in any way, uh, the model has to be broken down into the generating different components separately. So that even if, like for example, say uh, left hand and right hand, we separate it to make the tradition. And then maybe the model can 
as a whole result with the combined combination of left and arm and the right, there should be some new combination, right? Because those things are set right, generate separately and trans separately. So they will there will be something new as a whole like result, even if one each left hand or one right hand uh, harmony would exist probably in the training set. But so but I didn't uh, in my network, I didn't like have that kind of like breaking down into the different parts. And probably that is why if I'm correct, there would be not a lot of new whole new things. I'm just wondering if you have like Two different, like you trained on two different cultural harmonies and see what type of music would come out. Mm. So just right. It's a, so I think the, also the right answer should be from my mother, probably not. But okay. I'm also quite sure there's a, there's a lot of things like that has a, this notion of interpolation or even extrapolation in any sense, not only the chord, but the harmony and the sound as well. It's just, so my no is only limited to my. Really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker once more. We have TikTok, I guess, to ask more questions. All right. And then that actually concludes all the in person conference of the course. And then good luck with the panel.